greeting David and, and whatever the Lord puts on your heart. You've got some books out there on the table. Yeah, come, and, come and talk about it. Well, first of all, I want to say what a privilege it's here to be here. Um, it's been a great, great convention. There's been the speakers and what God has brought in these last few days has been really phenomenal. Uh, the thing that I felt really strongly this morning about, it was so good to see that I know that when Sister Gwen died and Sharon took over, uh, we said, God, help her, help her. There's a big hole to feel there. And we often felt a real burden uh, for her. And this morning as we saw God orchestrate the board and things happening, and our burden was too, what about the next generation? Because many of the people that were part of End Time Handmaidens we're elderly people too. I mean, we're, we're, we're growing older too. But what about the next generation? And today, it was such a, such a confirmation of the faithfulness of God. As he put things in place, structure, and, you know, God is so faithful. And I, I just want to say we are, we're for you. We're standing with you, beside you. And uh, we're praying that God will just pour out his blessing upon the end-time handmaidens and you know, we haven't been intimately involved over the last years. Our pathway went a different way, but we've always loved the people, and we always believed in the vision of what God gave. So we're here to say today that God is going to do great things through end time handmaids and servants, and we're so thankful for what God has done, how he's established and, and really a structure here and, and, and infrastructure that is going to be purpose for the next generation. And I was also very touched uh, uh, about the, the last speaker, uh, is it Ian from UK? Um, he's interesting to listen to. I enjoyed him. But it, it, uh, I can just say I can see that God needs to give us wisdom uh, to relate to people. You know, we have great truth and God has given us great truth, but we have to be relatable to this generation. We have to have the wisdom of God to go into places where angels fear to tread. And sometimes we have to hold our peace and just, just work on relationships and build things. But the, what his testimony this morning was, was really great. I can see how God is really involving people in government and how we, we really have great hope of what God is doing. So for Siggy and I, we, we continue to travel around the world. We had a great uh, our uh, inheritance in South Africa, that's really been our second nation over the last 30 years. We go back there twice a year. Uh, you know, it's something that God puts you in a certain place and he gives you favor in that particular place. And that's where we found the favor of God in South Africa. And we've seen such amazing things happen over the years and, and uh, powerful things. The church is just exploding there in many places. And it's exciting to see that happen. And we've been there. We saw little kids that were 8 and 10 years old. Today, they're pastors of churches. We've seen the next generation come into play in South Africa. It's really been something that really is rewarding to see. And also, it's been great to see how God has brought Siggy back to Germany to minister in German. Oh, after many years, where we weren't even uh, going there. But we saw such great things happening in Germany this last time. And we know it's, it's a time, just a confirmation of what God has said here many times. God is breaking through uh, in the nations of the world. And uh, we're working together. Our burden is to build the body of Christ. We want to build the body of Christ. And we may not all agree on every detail. But I believe that we have to have the spirit of unity to work together. And I feel so strongly about that. It doesn't matter what you call your church or group. We have to have the ability to work together because Jesus said that's the only way he'll know that I'm with you if you have unity and love. That's the picture that the world will see. So I just, that's our heart. We want to work in unity and build together for things in this generation and generation to come. And our favorite verse is, and I wish I had the Bible to read it, verse 7 can I use your Bible? I won't destroy your notes. And then I'll be done. Well, not exactly. Some people are gifted in preaching. That's not my gift. Okay. 
Was it verse 71? I just forgive my... Even Psalm 71, 18. This is God's promise he gave us. This was a verse to us this year. Even when I'm old and gray, do not forsake me, O God, till I declare your power to the next generation, your might to all that are to come. Amen. That's God's promise to us. Thank you. I'm going to be surprised what I'm going to read. Thank you. This morning, Ecclesiastic chapter 3, my brother started off. I had to smile about it. And I'm just going to read from verse 1 to verse 11. There's a time for everything, a season for every activity under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to scatter stones and a time to gather stones. A time to embrace and a time to refrain. A time to search and a time to give up. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to mend. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. What does the worker gain from his toil? Have I seen the burden God has laid on men? He has made everything beautiful in his time. He has also set eternity in the hearts of men. They yet they cannot fathom what God has done from the beginning to the end. Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. And Lord, I pray like I always pray. Let me not be an interrupter. Let me an interpreter. Well, I can interpret the heart of the Father for this moment and for this hour. Lord, there's so many new handmaidens are dedicating their life anew and afresh. I just pray, oh God, that we understand the timing and the purpose for what you're doing in this day. And Lord, I thank you for this convention. I thank you that you have taken out your nailed scarred finger and put it in the keyhole of our soul and then locked us for destiny and purpose. And Lord, I just ask you to bless the handmaid and to bless Sharon and Phil, to bless all these people, oh God, who are in charge. And Lord, as they travel the nation and move, that they will know this is the hour and this is the time to press towards the high calling in Christ Jesus. Help me, Lord. Anoint me because I know it's only anointing which breaks the yoke and sets us free to walk in that liberty and the power of your spirit. I pray, Father, I pray this in the most powerful name in heaven and earth, Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, it's a wonderful scripture when you read it, and many people believe as you study the book of Ecclesiastic. I don't think there are many who really say that the book of Ecclesiastic is the promised book. You know, there are books in the Bible where you just put their finger on, and you can fish out a promise to encourage your heart. Now, the book of Ecclesiastic is not like that. You have to put your teeth in, and they get a hold of it, what God is really saying in this hour. And you know, you you can see how some Bible scholars actually believe that that Solomon in his old age had a new revival and that God gave him a new sense upon his life. Now, when you look at Solomon's life, you know that Solomon was born as David comforted Bathsheba and he called her peace and forgiveness. And remember how the prophet came and he said, listen, this is not only peace and forgiveness. This is Jedediah, the darling of the Lord. And you know, God fulfilled every promise. He was the wisest man, the richest man. The queen of Sheba came and she went on a journey and she traveled for days to see Solomon's power and Solomon's wisdom and Solomon's greatness. And she came out and she said, the half has not even been told unto me how powerful this man is. And yet, Time has done something to him. Time has drawn him away from the purpose and destiny and the great power and manifestation of God. 
And I realized when I look at this and read this, that many of us, we don't realize what time is. Listen, time is not for eternity. Time is for now. When you up in eternity, I will tell you this. 40 years ago, what I have done 40 years ago will be the same as I would do now. Because there's no time. Because these things i done 40 years, 30 years as I served the Lord 50 years now. These times I have done 25 years ago, it will be the same as now. Because when I stand before him, there's no time. And all will melt together. And God has just used the time, Cairo time, appointed time to produce decisions, to birth destiny, and to birth for purpose. And you see what the devil does? He steals our time. He wastes our time. Now, here there's two things I cannot choose. I have not chosen when I'm born, where I'm born, and when I'm die. I don't choose that. I don't know when I die. I don't know when I lay my life down in America and South Africa or Europe. I don't know if I live 10 years, years, 20 more years, or maybe only to tomorrow. I don't know because I cannot choose it. But from the time I'm born to the time I die, there is a season in my life where I have to make choices. And decision, because what God does, there's a pendulum swing in our life. Now you can put, go yourself and put yourself in a room. Lock the door and be so spiritual that you know everything inside out in your life. Guess what? Time will do its job. You will come out old, unfulfilled, and you will, can keep it. You will have the same as you outside in a field. Time will have the same job on you. Uh, separating yourself, protecting yourself, self-preservation. As when you give yourself to God, totally. That is a pendulum swing. Now, you can see something here in what Solomon understood. Now, one of the miracles is this. This is the second generation of handmaiden. Now, I'm not saying now that the first generation went in the desert. But in some ways, we were in the desert. I remember when Gwen and I used to preach. We believed that Jesus would be back in the 80s. We didn't think he would live one day beyond the 80s. And we believed all kinds of things. Full, full of determination. Now, what did the Lord do in the first generation? Now, today, people wait for revival. And revival is what? Many of us think revival is miracles. The sign, see, the crippled walk, the blind, see, or whatever. Well, that's all right. But signs and miracles are not possessions. They just help our unbelief. So that we come in from a redemption to the possession of what God wants in our life. Now what happened to the second generation? The second generation born in the desert. Be nomads. Didn't know how to sow. Didn't know how to harvest. Living from the manna. Living from the water out of the rock. Living for miracles. Here they come what? Into the promised land. And what? Miracles stopped. Why? Because they had to transform themselves from nomads to harvesters, to farmers, to people who own lands, to people who own possessions, to people who knew and learned seasons. Now today, many of us are spiritually ignorant. I mean, well, let me face it. Some of us may pray, what kind of foolish prayer is that? When you go out in the garden and you pray for gold to grow on a tree. It's stupid. Gold don't grow on a tree. Imagine what hours you waste to pray. God, give me gold. Let it grow on a tree. Stupid. Now, some of us are spiritual stupid like that. There are spiritual principles 
which the church has to learn. Where we have to sow and harvest. For the Lord speaks about that you build on gold and silver and precious stone. Now they don't grow on any tree. The tree are great. You have them in the garden. They are there to give you fullness, greenness, freshness, stimulation. But you can build on it. Any fire can bring that wood. You have grown and laughed and admired. Now you know that you can pray, pray, pray. Maybe you find some gold. But somebody has to be motivated to become a gold digger so that you have your miracle. Somebody has to go underground. Somebody has to do the job. Now you see, now when I believe that the pendulum has come, now there's a time and a season in all of us. And there's a Cairo time. The Cairo time you don't choose. Cairo times are like this. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you and he comes and changes your life upside down and you make decisions to move into seasons. Now I want to just show you some pendulum swing. I don't think I can get through it, but I just pick a few. Because a pendulum swing is in all of our life. And I think sometimes... People become so spiritual that we forget that God is not only working in our spirit. He works in our soul. He works in our mind. He works in our body. He works through our life. And my life is not just spirit. My life is me. This is just the body. But inside, there's things. The kingdom of God has to be established to decisions and timing. Now hear what he said. There's a time to plant. And there's a time to uproot. Now you can see what God done. He didn't create man on the first day. And he said, listen, man, I create you, Adam, and I'm going to teach you how to be a scientist. I'm going to teach you how to be a gardener. I'm going to teach you how to create. No. He planted first. He created first. He created an environment. For men to live in. He did not even have to be born. He created him full maturity, full knowing, full power, full glory. And he put him what? He put him into the garden. In an environment. Now this year is an environment. End time hands create an environment some churches can create. Because what did the Lord do? As the children of Israel came out of Egypt, God's glory is manifested in many levels. And every one of us has an experience of a certain weight and the level of the environment we have created. Now, what did he do? First of all, he was above them. Why? Because he had to teach slaves how to look up. Slaves did not look up. Slaves looked down. They looked to work. They looked to sweat. They look. And so what the Lord do? He created the cloud. And he created the fire. And he made the slave get a new body language. Because to see the glory, they had to look up. They had to look up to the fire. Look up. But then... For him, it was not only his desire for them to look up. He wants to come amongst them. And here, what did he have to do with these slaves? He had to pour out the spirit of wisdom. And they had to create an environment as they learned how to sew and learned how to put colors together and learned how to be architects and builders. And they created an environment For God who come from above, amongst them. But now he's not only amongst us, he's within me. So what do I need to do? Now every prophet the Lord speaks to, what do they got to do? First they have to destroy, root out, pull out, so you can build and plant. And you see the pendulum swing comes like that. There's some things for us, for God to renew himself in my environment. 
what I have to do to root out, to pull out. So God can what? Build and plan. There's a time to plan and there's a time to uproot. Look what he did to Gideon. The Gideon was from the tribe of Manasseh. The tribe of Manasseh means he makes me forget. Now what did, what happened to Manasseh? Why did the Lord Jacob crisscrossed his hand and he blessed Ephraim before Manasseh? Why? I said, Lord, why? And I realized something. The reason what happened to Manasseh, have you know what? Joseph created an environment. What did he take this little boy? And he said, Lord, this little boy will make me forget my sorrow. They will make me forget my sorrows for my dead, the betrayal of my brother. He will make me forget. You know what the modern Jews have read it? Modern name means Manasseh. To regain your inheritance under difficult circumstances in the absence of friends and loved ones. Why? Now, why did the Lord crisscross? Because Ephraim made double fruit for. Now, what happened is when you don't create an uproot so God can build and plant and you let the seed grow in your life, you will never come into that new environment. Well, then some of us, we love the Lord, but the Lord only makes us forget. He doesn't give us a future. If he doesn't really have the future, you know what Ephraim do? Even Joseph said, I'm not going to stay behind. You're going to take my bones and even take them into the purpose and into the plan of God. Now, what did Gideon have to do? Before he became, remember when the angel came, he was, had a complex. He said, listen, we didn't see any miracles. We didn't experience anything. We were released in our father's house. We are hiding and dressing wheat in the wine press. We live in the mountains, but we still dwell in the caves. And what happened? First thing he had to do, he could never be the man with 300 men if he did not uproot first the idols of his father. If he did not uproot, there's a timing in your life where you have to uproot things. So God can sow and plant and bring forth a new harvest in your life. Second thing he says, pendulum swing. Listen, you can never ever be powerful if you only want to be positive. God can use every positive and turn it into negative, And every negative and turn it into positive. And how do you get power? Electricity. Positive and negative. And you know, some of us, we're tired so hard to have everything positive. Positive feeling. Positive ministry. Positive power. But we don't know how to let the valleys and the darkness and the loneliness and the sorrow, because I'm right here, my brother, how he produced life to the greatest hour of loneliness. It was a timing. He does not have to relive it. Now, some of us, if you just let it slip by, you become numb. Now, he says this, there's a time to kill. And there's a time to heal. Now, the Lord says this, do not think I bring peace on earth, but a sword. Take your cross. Now the cross, it's not the burden you carry. The cross is a killer. The cross must kill. And you cannot just say, Lord, help me keep die. It's a timing. There's a timing in your life where you have to surrender. And who you allow God to help you to die so that he can live. It's a timing in your life. You cannot just do it any moment, any time. God has to bring it into your life. Now, I, I preached this many times, but I got to tell this. Remember Peter? Now, Peter been in best Bible school there is. He had the greatest miracle. He had a great time with Jesus. But even with Peter, there came a time where he had to kill. In all our life, we have to kill. I think some of the stuff, remember what God, God says in, in Joel? He doesn't say he's going to kill the cockroaches and the canker worm and the worm. He's going to restore the time they have killed. In your life. He's not going to kill it. And you see some of us. We have made out of this creep pets. We feed these things we should kill. 
And you know, you, all of us can feed certain things. So if you're calm inside and if you're not up, upheaval. Now hear what happened to Peter. Remember many times we want to be spiritual to influence the natural. But sometimes God chooses the natural to show us the spiritual side of what he wants to do. And here's Peter in the upper room. And he's hungry. And he waits for the woman to make him dinner. And God prints him in a trance. And as he in his trance, he sees the sheep. And the seed comes down, and there's all kinds of creep in there. And the Lord said, "This rise, Peter, kill and eat. Three times. No, Lord, I'm a Jew. I'm not going to kill a pig. I'm not going to kill a lobster. I'm not. Rise, Peter, kill and eat. No, Lord. Now, what did he have to do? It was a timing. He did not know. That the guy would be on the door, God accepted, but Peter would reject Cornelius. He did not know, but Peter was full of prejudice. It was all right. But now was a new timing. And as that sheet came down, what he had to do? Kill. Kill his prejudice. So that prejudice would not kill him. If Peter would not have done that, guess what? He would never experience that God has no respect as a person. That he was not only the God of Israel, but the God of the Gentiles and the God of the nation. That God was going to enlarge the Jew to accept that. Cornelius. And you see, some of us, I know in my ministry, and when I used to travel with Gwen behind the Iron Curtain. I can tell you how your experience affects your emotion. The first time you were in Russia, you know the story. How Gwen and Danny was there and David came and, and Jim was there and we had uh, Herman came who spoke Russian. And the first time ever going into Russia, I remember I lived 15 years under the Russian occupation. And I had many experiences with the Russian. We would hate the Russian. I studied five years Russian. I refused to learn it. It was my way of rebellion. I've been sorry ever since. But what does it do? My experience. It feeds. You know what the Lord says? He says eternity in our hearts. Now what is eternal? There's only three things which are eternal. Everything passes. Tongues passes, prophecy passes, everything which is in part because the fullness of time will come. Now, what is eternal? And what does the enemy steal? There's three things, I call them triplets. A threesome cord cannot be broken. Now, these three things last. Eternity starts within us. Faith, hope, and love. These these three things are eternal. Because they are there, bring bring eternity within my heart. And what does the enemy want to kill? That's the things they kill. You can speak in tongues, you can prophesy and have no faith. You can sit in church and have no hope. You can believe how many people are depressed, downhearted, how we struggle to love. And you know, I realize as the pendulum swing comes, as these three things God won. And I know I when we went behind the Iron Curtain, Gwen and Jim, they were praising the Lord. You know how she is? She goes to the soldier, talks in tongues. And Herman and I, scared. 15 years to board us, since I'm six years old. I was shaking like this. I couldn't even look at these guys. Why? I loved the Lord. I had no hope, no faith. I thought I'd be done right there. What happened? I had to turn my face. I looked at her many were five years in Polish slave labor camp. For 19 years old, the Russian tried to kill him. And I looked at him, he was white as she. We loved the Lord, but we had no faith. I only knew that hope would bring through me. Well, what did I have to do through all these years? Ten years I smuggled Bible. What did the Lord have to do? Kill what killed me. 
kill the thing that killed me. And I know if I wouldn't have done it, my ministry wouldn't be the same. If he would have not gone to the underground church, I would not have been the same because I had to kill what kills me to take my freedom and my liberty. And there's some things in us which kills us. And we got to kill it. The cross, to be free, you can never just be free because you have a good Christian lifestyle. You can only be free when God comes with his timing. And the pendulum swing comes, and suddenly, in the time of your life, you have to surrender who you want to rebel. You have to give up who you want to run. There's a time to kill, and there's a time to heal. In the stripes, we are healed. Remember Elisha, he, when they come to the first thing, <laughs> When you come out of, out of Egypt, you don't get sweet water, you get bitter water. The prophets get bitter water. Israel, and what happens when bitter water comes and it does not refresh your soul? Well, you complain and you crumble. And God had to make the water sweet so they could drink it. Now, I just want to pick a few. The Lord speaks about there's a time to laugh and a time to weep. Now, I believe these emotional things are very important because I know that many Christians are so distant to grieve that we cannot expect comfort. Now, the Holy Spirit is a comforter. And if he cannot comfort our soul, and I need comfort in my heart and comfort in my soul, and you see, so there's a time to weep. Now, what weeping do? When you laugh and you can weep, it takes away complacency. Jesus, can't you ever wonder why Jesus wept on Lazarus' grave? He knew he's going to raise him up from the dead. It says he was angry. His emotions were so touched by the unbelief of the people that he expressed his mourning. And you know, there's a time to weep. Uh, I know when I was to Botswana, I told this the last convention, and I had a woman's convention, five, six hundred women. And I said, Lord, what do I preach here? And the Lord says, these people make comfort. They're distant to grief. They don't know how to feel. They don't know how to laugh. They, they have become spiritual leprosy. Will you untouched? Will you comprehend certain things? But you don't feel it. God don't touch my heart. He doesn't touch my life. And you know, as I start preaching, I don't know what I preached. But I gave it all to God. And these people came running to the altar, screaming, crying, howling. And I said, God, what did I do? I thought I'm going to comfort them. He said, yes. They cannot be comforted except they feel pain. Except they feel what they suffer. Except they're touched. And you know, in all our life, there's a time to mourn. There's a time to weep. Because there's a time to laugh. And you see what spirituality will do. It will bring you on an even keel. For you pray everything away and believe everything away. But it doesn't touch your heart. It doesn't touch your life. It doesn't touch you. And everything we hear is a statistic. But it doesn't bring a fear. I know it says, you know, us women. Sometimes we're the greatest intercessors when we're hurt. I remember one day many years ago. Oh, when you're in ministry, you can get so hurt. And I cried, and I interceded, and I prayed, and I said, God, nobody loved me, nobody understands me, Lord, what did you do with me? The Lord says to me, Siggy, do you think I'm a man, that your tears move me? I'm not a man, I'm God. I see the intent of your heart, come on now, get your coins and your land. You know what it done? It made a difference. I cry, but not anymore self-pity. 
And I felt sorry for myself. For I knew I can't cry it out. There's a time to cry for a nation. Time to feel for people. Time to express your sorrow. Time to express it. But you can't do it. Seasons. And if you let the seasons go by, you know how many of you suffered and you never cried? You have become depressed. You're a depressed eagle. You can't fly. You have an eagle, but you lost the ability to fly. You know what flying means? That you hey, get over every limitation. That's what flying means. God doesn't say, I give you wings to fly. You grow wings. That means every limitation, no limitation is higher than the ability to rise above it. And you know, for you and I, to rise above these limitations in my life and in your life, you got to be touched in your emotion. You can't just go out here and think that you don't need to feel nothing. It's a season. He said, if you don't know how to cry, you don't really know how to laugh. Now, laughter means, ha, ha, ha. You can laugh in the spirit, it's all right. Ha, ha, a release. But I'm talking about expression of joy. Because the joy of the Lord is my strength. For that joy comes from inside out like a well. And you can't have it if you just live on an even keel. There's a time. This is a good to express sorrow, but you can't stay in sorrow. Then God comes in his time of comfort and the time of laughter and blessing. You need to laugh. Then he says this, there's a time to mourn and there's a time to weep. Now mourning and weeping is not the same. Weeping is a response to something which happens to you. Mourning is a time. What does mourning do? Mourning takes your identity away. When you see a king, in those days, every person who had a profession sold it in their clothes. You recognize the king, you recognize the Levi, you recognize the priest, you recognize the shepherd. They didn't need to tell you, give you a card. You knew it on their clothes. But when the morning time came and they took off their identity, and they put on sackcloth. You could not recognize the king from the shepherd and the Pharisee from the traitor. Because a nation mourned. You know, there's this amazing scripture in the Bible about the law of war. Now, the modern Christian doesn't understand the Old Testament. Because we only understand Jesus, but not God the Father. And Jesus did not come to do his own job. He came to show who God the Father was. Now he said, so this is amazing scripture. I use it many times. It's a scripture of war. He says, when the Israel troop comes into a village, they were not allowed to take captives. They had to kill everybody except the virgin. A woman who has not known a man. He said to the Hebrew soldier, if you like the woman, take her and make her your wife. But she has to go to one month of modern, take off her clothes, cut her nails, cut her hair, and mourn her mother. And father for one month. And you know, imagine that in the natural. They're just humans like us. Your God, he takes you, he loves you, he adores you, he saves you. But they kill your mom and dad, your brother and sister. Can you imagine the anger? And you know how many times our mourning today has turned into anger? That we actually have an angry church and the angry church cannot reach the nation because the meek in heart can only reach the nation because the meek in heart shall surely possess the land. So you can have angry prayers and angry worship and never ever make an impact. Because why? We're all angry. I can't sometimes have to turn off that TV. I'm so mad. I'm so mad what happens to America. 
I'm so mad that America gives up their freedom and their liberty. I'm so mad I came here because I wanted to be free. And America gives it up. I'm mad. I turn it off. And I mourn. Because if I don't mourn, I'm angry. Mourning breaks my anger. And it comes when I mourn for America. Weep for America. I've put on my morning clothes. I say I have to kiss this nation goodbye. They don't get it. They don't get it, the church. They're so worried about their lifestyle that they don't know how to mourn for values which are last for generations upon generations. So what do women do? It's a time to mourn now. Because if you don't mourn, you're going to be mad. You're going to be angry. And if I'm angry, I lose what I pray for. I can't get a hold of that. What God does. And what do women do? Mourn. Mourn her mother and father. Mourn her lifestyle. Takes off your beauty. And after one month, she decides, or he decides, if that woman will be his bride to be his wife. You know what transformation had to come? She can't mourn on a wedding feast. She has to dance. He has to come in harmony with a land she didn't know, with a culture she didn't know. She has to play a melody in her heart for she flows in harmony. Do you see how many of us? And I say, God, all of us. He did not, I did not choose him, he chose me. He took me just like that woman. He took me. I had a mourn. My life, I had a mourn. I remember when I became a Christian, but I had to give up and I was mad. He said this and that and the other. And what I had to do, my mourning, I had to do what? Into dancing. That doesn't mean I need to wiggle all the time. That means in harmony. In movement, with the spirit, in harmony, in the melody. Remember David? Oh, he was going to bring the presence of the Lord and he didn't know how. And he put the ark on the ox carts like the Philistine. The priest forgotten how the heavy, the weight of the glory was. They didn't know what it was to carry the weight on the shoulder. And he forgot. And he slain Uriah. He just wanted to help out. He was not a bad guy. He just wanted to help out. And God killed him. And he put that ark into Obededom's house. And God blessed Obededom. As his glory rested in his house. And David came. And out of the anger had to come morning, and out of the morning there had to come a dance. As the Lord brought his presence into the temple. So there are times to dance. There's a time to mourn. So without mourning, you're not getting rid of your anger. Never. I mourn America. I mourn it. I mourn this nation. I love this nation since I've been this little. All I wanted to be in this nation. You know how much we would risk our life to listen to the voice of America. We would climb in an attic, press our ears as they had German translation to hear a message of freedom in our depression. I love this nation. We don't know how much he would crawl out of prison in Poland, crawl in 20 minus degrees, touch the flag and kiss it. For what? Freedom. Freedom. 
I'm mourning this nation. I'm mourning. But I believe out of my mourning, God will give me a dance. Where I can move in a harmony of a spirit to know that not my will, but his will be done. It's time now. If America don't understand the timing, we miss it. If you don't move and let God use the time in eternity, it will not be said with an heart. Let me just, you can see, you can preach almost one hour on each thing. But I just want to use one more thing before I close because you have a lot of things to do. This says here, there's a time to scatter stones and there's a time to gather them. Now, this is an interesting thing. Because stones are not bad or good. Stones is what you do out of them. You know what I love? The Lord speaks to Israel. And he says this. Listen, take a bunch of stones, throw it in the Moabite field. And when you throw it in the Moabite field, you're going to destroy the harvest. And I think to myself, Lord, I'm a stone, living stone. Throw me in a Moabite field. Cast me in. Lord, I don't need to do anything. I just be there. So I kill the seed of flesh and kill the seed of of deception. Throw us in. Now, remember David. He just had one little stone in the brook. He didn't, he forsook out, saw it. There's a time to throw stones. To kill Goliath. And you know what? You know, God speaks about when you have stone in your heart, the seed will not grow. So what are you doing? Instead that you let the stone become hard in you so that you don't have any depths in you. The root cannot go in. Let that stone within you be thrown away. So Goliath, the giant, can be killed. Now, when you look at David, he was so phenomenal. All of Israel was shaking, but it was his time. He had a time of the Lord who he knew as he killed the bear and he killed the lion. How in the world is that Goliath going to kill him? It was a time. You see, they, all the others had the same time. But they didn't do anything. They were scared. All of Israel was scared, including Saul. But only one guy knew his timing. I'm going to get that Philistine. I'm going to get him. The stones are for something else also. Remember the Lord says, stones are there for memorials. Now I preach this many times. I believe that many Christians have spiritual Alzheimer's. You know, my mom had seven years Alzheimer's. We came from the mission field. The Lord came, took us from South Africa. My mom came from Germany and I had to look after her for seven years. That's how much he loved my mom. Even I looked after her and I learned things in the seven years as my mom became my child. As I would take her my hand and could go and just become my child. And I realized what Alzheimer's does. If you have no power to remember, you have no future. And if you have no power to remember, you can never be comforted. My mom lived to the Second World War. She raised us under communism, my brother and sister, under Nazis. We were always enemies of the state because my mom and dad always loved the Lord. But before my mom died, she had a stepmother. She went out of the house with 16, married my dad with 19. But that stepmother had a power with her for 83 years. And she died two weeks before. I could not comfort my mom. 
She was strong. She's a strong woman. She's strong. And I come many days and she would stand there saying, so, Mom, what are you scared of? Oh, is Ma there? No, Mom, she's dead long ago. Oh, really? Two minutes later. Mom, she's dead. Couldn't come for her. Why? She heard my voice, but she forgot. And you see what you experience today is tomorrow is your past. You may be waiting for the next convention, for the next speaker, for the next input, but what does it help if you forgot? If you forgot one, God's impact, God's breath, God's power, and he has not reached deep within you to change and transform us. What does it forget? It's not just your future and your presence. It's my past. Because in eternity, it all melts together. Past, future, and present. When I stand before God, my whole life is a past. A past. I hear what the Lord do. He didn't want Israel to forget. Every sermon, every new beginning, they had to look into the past. To remember what God has done. To remember what he has brought them through. Now here they are. Second generation, just like they had made, move into the promised land. What did they do? Every tribe had to take a stone from the middle of Jordan. Carry it out and build a memorial to remember what? 430 years of slavery? No. How they grumbled and complained? No. The Lord says, here I built you up a memory so that you remember how I fulfilled my promise, how I brought you to Jordan, and how I'm going to bring you into the promised land. Because if you forget, If you forget, how are you going to conquer the giants? And how are you going to possess the land? There's a time for everything. A time to be silent. And a time to speak. A time to love. And a time to hate. You say, no, that that cannot be to hate. Yes. You know what the Lord say? Those who hate dishonest gain, they shall be leaders. Those who hate dishonest gain, they shall be leaders. You know what else it said? Hate evil, you who love the Lord. Hate every false way. No one can to serve to master you hate that one you know what hate means to have a strong aversion he said else he said if you don't hate your father and mother and some translated if you don't love me more that's not what it says there has to be if you don't love me more if you don't have a strong aversion it's a time it's not all in once it's a season for I come and you rise up and you cannot just compromise. You got to hate unrighteousness. You have to have an aversion against sin. You cannot compromise and grow if you don't hate sin. If you don't hate the things in your life and you make every lovey dovey. No. Today we turn to make everything neutral. Everything neutral in gender and the way we look, we are neutral people. And what happened if we make the church a it, we lost the power. The church is not a it, the church is a female. The church is a bride. She's not an it. And what the devil comes, he comes and he makes us neutral. For we all become alike. It's in our whole society and we don't hate it. We just become what? The instrument in the enemy's hand. Lesson. It's a season, a time. You can't choose it. You got to know the seasons in your life. 
You know, when it's, it's new seasons, how many times I prophesied, and I'm close with this. If you don't understand seasons, you will always want God just to have in your life, but you never know how to get out of your life into his. And many of us, like the bride, she sits in her bed, and the Lord shows himself to the lattice and to the window, and she longs for him to come in. But it's not a season for him to come in. It's the season for her to go out. And how can she experience the springtime in bed? The bed is a dream. The bed is intimacy. But it's not a springtime. A new life born out of her. And you see, many of us, we want Christ in our life. But we don't want to come out of our lives in his. It's a season. So when God comes and he shows himself to the lotus. And he shows himself to the window of your soul. And he says, come away, my beloved. Come out. Then you got to break out. You got to, all these things you heard, you can't just force it. I mean, I remember the first Russian tour we took, Gwen and I. Some of you, David's life was changed. There were 40 Americans in the Soviet Union we took them. Had a life vests on. Taking Bibles in into Soviet Union. And you know, for these American, we took them and we said, listen, when you come into the Soviet Union, you cannot tell them that you connected to us. You got to risk your life. David's life was transformed drastically for that one trip because he had a season in his life. He responded to come out of a Montana village, out of a Montana lifestyle. He never thought that he ever traveled the world. And now we're married 40 years. Our kids, some of you remember them, babies. Tammy's going to turn 39 and Ben 37. Time. Can't hold it. Can't hold it. Time is power. It's for this life, for this hour. And I pray that you will not miss your time. Don't let time is more important than money, than fame, than education, than anything. Some of the people can be educated, great lives, but their time is ticking away producing nothing. There's a time for everything. A season. A life. Learn the timing. Don't pray for gold on a tree. <laughs> Dig into the ground and find. It's a time to find and a time to search. Remember, some of us, we're not seekers. We're just lookers. The Lord said to me, remember, and I close with this, in Song of Solomon, chapter 5. He knocks at the door. Finally, the bride responds, comes out of the door, and God is, Jesus is gone. I said, Lord, what in the world? Why did you not wait? I mean, you get out of bed finally. You rouse her, and she comes out, and she's full of fire. And you're gone. And he says to me, clearly, clearly, he said, Siggy, I'm making out of Lucas seekers. There are too many lookers. Lookers are window shoppers. Seekers are something you only seek when you find last something. You dig, to, dig, dig. You dig. You find some of the gold diggers in South Africa and mine diggers. I don't want their life. Rubbles and rubbles. Carloads of stone. Before they find that diamond, you buy it. And that's in the Bible. That's God. You can live on the surface, but there's time to search. And there's a time to find. Because you will never search without finding. But you have to take the time to do it. Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for the handmaidens. I thank you for Sharon and Phil. Lord, how I've watched Sharon and Phil and how they have kept their purity. And Lord, when I just remember how she was such a young girl only four years, four, only a few years back, not knowing what holds.
Lord, how she was loyal, even sometimes, Lord, when she didn't know what would happen. Lord, how she was loyal and still loyal. doesn't matter what happened in their life, Lord, that they knew their timing. Lord, time to weep and time to laugh and time to give up and time to hold and time to just dance and time to just worship. And Lord, I just thank you for their lives. And I just ask you, Lord, that just I'm so encouraged to see what you even have done from last year to this year. Lord, how you have a hope and the anticipation and that you even brought people with them, Lord, to them who strengthen their hands and give them strength to keep on that vision. Lord, I just thank you that there are so many women and so many men lost in churches not knowing how they belong and what they can do because they're just there and then they don't know, Lord, how to pluck in and how to be used to you. And Lord, I thank you that the handmaidens is a vehicle, an instrument you use to reach people, Lord, only not to reach them, but to bring people into the harvest, to make people whole, to make people, Lord, not only, not people who are just fanatic and, and who are just spiritually, but people who are sound in body and sound in spirit and sound in mind, the Lord, who are representative for what you're doing in this day and in this hour. Lord, I thank you for the anointing which breaks every yoke. Let your blessing just be on these men and women who take their vows today as they commit their life, oh Lord, to serve you, to eat what you want them to eat and to sleep what you want them to sleep. Lord, it's so easy to say it, but it's so hard to do it. Lord, just bless them, I pray, and bless the rest of the convention and let this go out in the great blaze of your glory in Jesus name amen thank you so much Sydney. appreciate you so much I love you yes you're mine oh thanks wow wow Thank you, Father, for Siggy. Thank you. And for David. Thank you for bringing them to us. For the, for the treasures that you've poured out through her. Thank you, Lord, we're grateful. We're very, very grateful, Lord. Hallelujah. At this time, we're going to have the dedication of those who are joining this ministry. The very first world convention 